Hey folks, my name is Dylan and welcome to the Eat Wild Learn to Hunt webinar series. Now, at Eat Wild, we've been teaching folks how to hunt for a little over a decade here, uh, trying to make it more accessible and, and a welcoming place for maybe non-traditional hunters to come and learn how to hunt. Now, this this is this particular webinar, it's, it's for folks who, who, who might be just at the beginning of that journey and who are considering whether hunting can be for them. So what I've done in this webinar is broken it down into sort of three sections. The first section is my reflections on what hunting has meant to me and how it's sort of created this amazing life that I've been able to live. And I walk you through sort of that perspective and, and, and hopefully that gets you a bit excited about what could be ahead for you. Now, part two of this webinar series is reflecting on the journey that you might go on, some of the perceived barriers and challenges that might come with learning how to hunt and also some of the amazing gifts that comes with be taking on this life and going on this journey. And the third section of this webinar is talks about the courses and certifications and some of the workshop opportunities that you can help build that knowledge and, and, and skill set so that you can be a successful hunter. So this is part of a larger project uh, where I've taken uh, my online, I'm sorry, my, my field courses and classes that I've taught over the years and developed over the last 10 years. And we've, we've built a series of webinars with that content, uh, bringing in my community of mentors and, and recording sort of storytelling uh, and, and slideshows and videos so that you can, you can, you can access either through our Eat Wild website at eatwild.ca or go to our Eat Wild school uh, on the Thinkific platform and you can download the series of Eat Wild webinars that we have available to you uh, for this learning experience. And we have everything from meat care in the field, uh, like eat the, my approach to taking care of meat in the field. Uh, we have uh, webinars on how to still hunt in the forest, how to elk hunt, how to moose hunt. Um, and we're building up that repertoire. So there'll be new stuff there all the time. So if you like this, this course here and it gets you excited about hunting, you can be sure to come back, check out our website, find your way to our Eat Wild webinar series and and uh, continue the learning. And of course, if you're in the if you're in the British Columbia area, um, come out and join us for one of our field workshops. So hopefully you'll enjoy this, and I welcome you to the the journey of becoming a hunter. Okay, have fun. So before I get too far in here, I should introduce myself. My name is Dylan Ayers. I've been uh, uh, a hunter my whole life. I, I grew up in a hunting family that hunted and fished and gathered wild, wild food, and that's uh, that was our way of life. Um, I took up this opportunity to teach people how to hunt about ten years ago. As I as I noticed, more and more people were becoming more interested in where their food came from. And uh, and if you're on that journey of, of questioning, you know the 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 processes by which your food ends up on your table and you start to evaluating um, what decisions you, you will make in terms of to, to have that food on your table, um, whether you eat organic or, uh, or or to be a vegetarian or, or these questions will eventually lead you to, hey, maybe I can pursue hunting as a means of, of uh, get, you know, of attaining uh, wild source meat or organic meat uh, and uh, just evaluating the decisions you make, particularly around the meat they eat. So that seems to have really driven an interest in hunting in the last uh, 10 years. And I think also just, uh, you know, just a, a thirst for getting back to nature and uh, reconnecting with uh, a simpler way of life. And I think that's really driven a lot of interest in hunting. So I, I started this journey is to try to try and reduce barriers and make hunting more accessible to folks. And, uh, and that's what found me through to building the Eat Wild project. And, uh, and that's why I'm sort of here today talking to you, to you folks. So let's, let's get into the first bit I want to talk about here is, um, kind of, uh, giving my background as a hunter and what it means to me. So let, let's walk through it and, I love this slide. This is sort of why I hunt slide. And I think <laughs> it is for me, this represents just this incredible journey into wilderness and, uh, this, uh, such a simple way of life that I, that it's so lost in our busy urban lives. But on a trip like this, where you have your backpack on your back and you're hiking into the woods for, into the mountains for 10 days on end and, uh, everything you need to survive is, is in that backpack. And, you have one job and, uh, you know, every, from the moment you wake up in the morning to when you put your head on the pillow at night, um, is to, is to try and find an animal to harvest. 
but also just sort of survive. It's really simple. Like you just got to get up, feed yourself and start hiking, looking. And uh, the simplicity of those days really is, uh, um, I find a lot of uh, joy in, but I also find a lot of uh, calmness and, uh, and it really makes me feel uh, um, all put back together after I have these sort of very busy, busy, congested lives here in the city, just the opportunity to relax and a very deep relaxation in, in these opportunities in the mountains. So um, there's lot, lots more I can share with you. And I love this slide here and it's a, you know, for me, hunting is a way of life. It, it's not, um, it's not a sport. Um, and it's, it's more than just finding food and, and, and just ob obtaining food. And this is a, a photo of my late father, uh, Bud, who was an avid harvester. And, uh, I love this picture because, um, he's really at peace in this moment. And, and, uh, he's, uh, you know, I, I, I know, I knew my dad as to someone who was, um, really struggled with his mental health and, uh, and had a hard time being at peace in the moment. And, and, uh, he, he lived a very full and rich life, but unfortunately he, he, uh, he, he passed early, uh, because of his mental illness. And, uh, but this photo really represents something for me that's important. And that's that kind of leading back to the previous slide where that, that simplicity of life, when you have sort of one job ahead of you, which is to hunt. Um, and, and, uh, it, it's really good for, for, for mental health. And, and, and for my father here, that he's at peace in this moment. I know he struggled to find those moments of peace where he was really present in the moment, sort of that mindfulness thing. And uh, I find the same thing. I, I find that I'm very mindful when I hunt a fish. I'm very focused, and uh, it really helps me relax and, like I said, get put back together. So I love this picture because it really just shows my father in that moment of completely um, present in the moment. And I, and I know what's going through his head here is that the reason why he's so relaxed is that he's he's met this singular purpose in his life, which is to procure food for the year. And for this moment, this is a moose that's on the tailgate of the truck. And no doubt it was a lot of work to get it from the field to the tailgate here. And and now he's able to enjoy a cold beer and and know that he has accomplished this super this incredibly important part of his way of life, which is to procure food and be able to feed his family, his friends, and and uh, support his community through um, having a moose in the freezer, which is so, you know, which is a very much a richness that, that he brought to, to his life and his community was sharing wild food with, with, with people and, and meals. And, and that really is at the center of his, of who he was. So in this moment, I love that, that photograph, but I think it represents for me, what hunting is about is it, it, it really gives me this very simple, um, this, this very foundational piece of what it means to be human and, uh, and to be able to, enjoy those moments and relax and be at peace and feel very, very human in moments. So anyways, it's a way of life for me. And I think there's sort of more to that as I, as I develop this, this slideshow here. I love this slide. It's a, uh, I was maybe 13 years old here. And this is, um, as a kid, I, I was brought into this hunting community. These are a bunch of my dad's buddies and, uh, they taught me how to hunt and they taught me course how to sneak around the woods and, and find whitetails and eventually how to hunt elk and moose and other things um but they also taught me a lot about life and and uh, and that was sharing relationships with people of different generations i think is extremely important for us because there's so much to learn from our elders and i think in our society we we typically tend to do a lot of activities outside of uh we don't do a whole lot of activities i should say outside of our peer group so if we go mountain biking we ride with people our same age group if we go um you know if you're if you're a runner or whatever you do that that uh, brings you with together with community community it seldom involves intergenerational relationships and it seldom allows you to to build relationships with people who have experienced a whole different life and a way of life different than you that they can share and provide guidance and mentorship so i've really in benefited from those relationships over the years, whether it's my career, within my relationships, um, and of course, just friendships that have lasted generations. Hunting also, it, it's a foundation of friendships. And I, I, I love this slide because this is uh, uh, my partner, Mickey, and uh, my friend, a friend from my good, good colleague and friend, Jana, and my friend, Shelly, from 20 years. And, and we're out on a hunt together. And what's special about hunting is it it brings you together with your friends. It forces you to go on these annual trips together and you connect and you go have this amazing work effort where you're working hard to potentially harvest an animal. You get to enjoy meals together at the end of the day. You, and, and this is, you can just see the, the glow in us here as we, this is a, an amazing day. We, we 
we ended up harvesting two deer on top of the mountain and backpacking them back to camp as a group. And it was just a fantastic day of, 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 of hard work, but also just friendship. And, and the great thing about this and the great thing about hunting is that I'll come back to these, like every weekend we'll, we'll, we'll reconvene in this amazing place together with this crew of amazing people. Um, you know, on a, the first weekend of October, we'll be there again together and try to replicate this experience. That's one thing that's great about hunting and hunting trips. And it's kind of, you get to stay connected with those friends of yours. Whereas again, these busy lives that we lead, like we often don't make time enough time to maintain our friendships, especially in such a substantial way, like on an adventure like this. I also really appreciate hunting. Uh, for me, it's been some a way for me to give back to community and to to share my knowledge with folks who would otherwise not be able to be uh, become hunters and harvest and have. This is a, after a ten day elk and moose hunt, and we've had a successful hunt. But all these guys, I've 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 taught them how to hunt, and and they come from urban lives or artists and musicians and neat folks doing other cool things, contributing to community in different ways. And, and I'm able to contribute to this community through sharing my knowledge of hunting and, and gathering. And uh, it's such super great to, exper- to, to be able to contribute. So for sure, hunting is, uh, for me, there's is the food, of course, and but there's just adventures that takes you to amazing places. And this is a a pack raft trip from a couple of years ago where we put our fingers on a map and, you know, flew into the middle of nowhere and floated out with pack rafts. And it was quite an adventure and, and just with great company and yeah, just going to places that no, not a whole lot of people can get to or, or, or would ever think of going and hunting kind of drives those adventures. Like it, it drives exploration into beautiful places. And while you might be in pursuit of an animal, you're really, you know, you're just, you're in pursuit of an adventure or just to see around a corner of another beautiful place. And that's what hunting, you know, I find that in, in hunting and in this way of life for sure. This slide is, this is a, so hunting can create community, uh, sorry, connectivity, I should say. And, uh, I love this, this slide here was, this is kind of, this was a moose that I shot last year. And I, I, um, I grew up as a moose hunter. My dad took me moose hunting and, uh, and, uh, my grandfather, uh, he was a moose hunter. He's, uh, um, he, uh, grew up in Winnipeg, on Winnipeg Lake in a, in a small, uh, community and, and hunted and gathered as an MAT community. Um, and, they shot moose in, in the winter to survive. And, uh, and when he came to BC after the war, my grandfather, uh, explored BC and, be, you know, became an expert moose hunter in, in British Columbia. And he showed my father how to hunt moose. And my father showed me how to hunt moose. And, um, my grandfather is long gone as, as is my father. And I actually stopped hunting moose about maybe, probably when my dad passed away, but maybe 10, 10, 10 or so years ago. And, I had started elk hunting and kind of developed a passion for that and had success with elk hunting. So I didn't really feel the need to, to, to go chase moose around and, and the freezer was full and also the, the, the type of hunting is different and in some ways more pleasant elk hunting. But after I shot this moose, I, I went and I sat with it and I had this intense awakening that I was a moose hunter and I have this long lineage going back to my father and my grandfather and my, and my family before that, that have always hunted moose. And I felt them all there, all my ancestors with me as I sat with this moose. And it was, it was an amazing visit with my father. It was an amazing visit with my, with my, with my grandfather as they guided me through processing this moose. And, and, it just allowed me to understand my connection with the place, with family, to the moose, and to this way of life that goes back um, a long, long, long time. And uh, for me, that was really, it was really important to reconnect with that. And uh, hunting allows me those moments. And I, I, I totally appreciate those opportunities and, uh, and try to listen to them when they, when they show up, you know. Hunting is, uh, and I'll probably hit on this later. It's like a, 
It took a lifelong journey to become a hunter. And, uh, and part of that journey, probably the biggest part of that journey is knowledge sharing. And, uh, I spend more of my, I start, I, I'm constantly mining for knowledge or, or, or sharing knowledge because it's really what makes uh, a successful hunter is how much knowledge you have to share and, um, and what you can, uh, uh, and, and, and what you can develop relationships with. So people share knowledge with you. And, uh, this is on a great hunt, uh, Ando and my hunting mentor, Jeff, and my good friend Ando on a, on a sheep hunting trip and just capturing that moment of sharing stories and knowledge. Another thing that I find so important with hunting is that it's a constant, uh, it allows me to develop new skills all the time. It kind of creates these opportunities, whether it's uh, learning how to run a jet boat or how to use a chainsaw. Uh, the last few years, we've been we've been discovering this concept of pack rafting, where we're paddling down rivers, and um, but all of this stuff are, are these like life skills: um, how to how to fix a generator, or how to how to how to put chains on your truck. All of these things are are important life skills that that we don't get a lot of opportunity if you're to do if you're ur- urban urbanite and to go out on hunting adventures it creates these opportunities to learn these things how to tie knots and how to set up a tarp all of this stuff is very very important skills and uh, we just hunting brings all those skills into the forefront so you need to develop those skills and and that's a fun process learning is fun and uh, and developing these skills is a, it's a hoot and um, yeah so I enjoyed that part of hunting So I'm going to shift into sort of the, the food aspects here. Cause I mean, that really is at the, the heart of this for me, the, the, what, what, what hunting means to me is food. And I think this is, you know, that the process from, you know, obviously taking an animal's life and then, uh, taking care of the animal, the meat from the moment you pull the trigger to, you know, to the process of, of here, we are butchering an animal in the field. We're going to carry those, we're going to break this animal up into manageable sized pieces. And then we're going to backpack it out to the, the truck or the boat. You saw the previous slide was where we had piled up the, the meat in a, in, in a boat, um, in game bags and such. And this whole process requires a ton of work and a ton of care, but really it creates connection. Like I, I, I like to ask this question when I, when I'm in, when I'm in, uh, in a classroom or whatever and teaching hunting and stuff. And I, and I say, Hey, has anybody ever had like chicken go rotten in the fridge and, uh, or a piece of meat or a piece of fish go rotten. And you know, everybody, you know, it happens to people all the time. They don't get around to cooking that chicken and it goes, it goes bad. So people put up their hands and I have never had a piece of game meat go bad in the fridge. It is, it is just unfathomable to me for that to happen because I'm so connected to where that that meat came from. I'm so connected to the the effort and the the animal that that gave its life for that piece of, that steak in the in the fridge that I couldn't even imagine the possibility of it ever it ever going bad. So, you know, I I mean, I, granted, I have had situations where I've driven off on an adventure and forgot two marinating steaks in the fridge. Well, you know, in those situations, I quickly get on the phone and find a volunteer to break into my house and, and save the steaks. And, you know, it doesn't take very long to find someone who will save a couple elk steaks. Uh, but anyways, it's uh, it just that, that connection, you see the sense of responsibility that you feel towards the meat, particularly for taking the animal's life. And then subsequently all the work that goes into it, um, that, that it's just a, a huge responsibility, but uh, it's one that I enjoy taking on. And, uh, and the better you take care of the the meat from from here to where it's served on the to when you take it out of the freezer, it, it, the better quality the meat will be, how, how better table fare it will it, it'll become. And uh, if you do everything right, it's excellent. So and uh, even if you screw up a few things, it's still pretty excellent. But anyways, we'll keep on rolling here. The I also like I mean kind of alluding to the previous slide, like the work that's involved with meat. I mean, it, you know, I I sort of and. and I, you know, I call it, we talk about meat karma sometimes, like it's, it, it, you just, you work so hard for this meat that you value it so much. And, um, and it is a bit of karma, I, I think, uh, like the, the more you take care of it, the more it, it feeds you and takes care of you. But the other part of it is like, it's another funny, so another thing that I, I, I talk about when I'm in, uh, you know, I, 
I um I feel this strange like I'll come back from a trip uh, with a with a deer or an elk or a moose and I'll 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 be butchering it in my kitchen and. I'll look at these beautiful loin steaks and I'm like, oh, those lovely little loin steaks and I'll put them on a plate and I'll walk them next door to my neighbor and say, here, have a couple of elk loin steaks. These are beautiful. They're the ni- one of the nicest cuts on the animal. And a neighbor's, wow, that, thank you so much. And like, I, I, I mean, my neighbors are my neighbors are great, you know, but I don't like, they're not like good friends or anything, but I feel compelled to share with my community as a hunter. And all hunters feel the same way. Like they, there's just this overwhelming, uh, need to share the harvest and i think it's something to do with karma or just maybe like just i I programmed as hunters you share with your community um and it's different i mean like you know you don't go to costco and see a hell of a deal on on t-bone steaks and bring them home and then walk them over to your neighbors hey this these look beautiful it was a great deal i'm gonna share these with you it's just it's a different way of approaching things and I, i you know despite the hard work, despite, you know, the effort that goes into it, it's still, you feel so privileged to be able to share it with people. And I think that's part of why it's such a, so special, this way of life. Food security is another thing that I, you know, I, I probably had a bit of quite a bit of privilege in my life because I, I have had my whole life. We've been able to harvest food and, and sort of maintain fruit full freezers throughout the seasons with food, with meat and fish um, from our harvesting adventures. And this year is super interesting. It's the first time we've recently had flooding here in, in British Columbia, severe flooding in the lower mainland. And, uh, and there's been panic buying happening. And I went, I walked into a grocery store and all the meat was gone from the meat aisle. And I'd never, the concept was totally foreign to me. And of course at home, we were just finishing up our hunting season. So Mickey and I have had a very successful season. So all of our freezers are full uh, beautiful wild meat and fish from the previous season and and we feel very secure right now in terms of our, our 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 food security but of course lots of people here are feeling vulnerable because hey like the the for the reason why of course is here is that the uh the food supply the, the trucks and trains can't get into vancouver as easily um things are better now but um but yeah just that that reality that you know that the food source could be taken away or not be available um as a hunter, I'm able to take full responsibility for whether my freezer is full or not. And that requires me to spend a lot of time out hunting um, and a lot of holiday time and resources to go and ensure, ensure that my freezers are full. But it's something that I choose to do uh, because I enjoy it so much. But also, I, I, amongst other benefits, I do enjoy the food security. Now, here's the fun part. I mean, it's just like endless foodie adventures, which is what I love about you know, having a freezer full of food and, and being able to, to share it with friends and community is that, you know, we're able to cook wonderful meals and have lots of people come over and, and, and share our, our, our bounty of wild food with just our community. And, uh, and our, the costs for us is, is, you know, relatively benign because we just take out a little bit of meat out of the freezer. So it's, it's not the same. And I know that, entertaining can be costly because of the cost of food and particularly meat um, because we sort of we've, we've chosen to spend resources on procuring meat in this fashion we have sort of a basically a richness and and we can share it and it's wonderful because I we have you know one or two dinner parties a week and there's you know it's not a it's it's wonderful that we can share and of course being able to share with the broader community and, and, and creating events and, and such where you can feed community and share within the community. It's uh, it's really a blessing. It's really a, a, one of the things that, you know, I feel so fortunate to be a hunter. So, all right. So this next section, I want to kind of introduce the idea of, of can hunting be your journey? And uh, I love this. This is my, my partner, uh, Mickey. Uh, and uh, we've had a successful bear hunt in this case and we're just we're packing bear out of the out of the woods and and uh taking it to the butcher and it's been a a wonderful day um and you know so many people i i think you know i think this next slide like you know who who are hunters today and who who, like and, and i'll and i'll be you know hunting has been a very um it's i think it's you know you know at least the mo- you know the modern perspective of a hunter is a very uh, is very much dominated by by white men i think if you look at the 
you know, images of, of what you'd see out there in the hunting community, whether it's on YouTube, people telling stories or in, in our sort of sort of stereotypes. It's very, it's a very white um, male dominated environment. Um, however, I would challenge that now. And I would say that this is the, 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 the face of hunting is changing dramatically. I think that there's a lot of interest from a diversity of folks who would be say non-traditional hunters. Um, but I, I feel like anybody can come be a hunter. Now I know that there's additional barriers for folks who don't come from traditional hunting backgrounds. And that's kind of what this presentation is a little bit about is like, how do we reduce some of those barriers and make it so it's a welcoming place for, for folks to feel included, to feel welcome so that we can have a truly diverse and welcoming in community of hunters. And I, I know that we're not there yet, but I'm hoping that we can find our way there. And if, um, I, you know, I, as, as Eat Wild and the community of Eat Wild, we're, we're all champions of creating a diverse and welcoming environment for, for all hunters. And I, and, uh, I hope, I hope you can see yourself as a hunter. Cause I think that's one of the hardest parts for a lot of people is that if you don't see yourself as a hunter and you don't see people who represent, um, you know, your, your own back personal journey, your personal background, that, that it, it can be, it can be difficult to see yourself there. And I, and I, I hope that we can be part of, that uh, journey for you and make you all feel welcome and comfortable as we, as we, you know, create this new community of folks, which I'm really excited about. So when it comes to hunting, like, I think that there's a lot of, uh, that journey I'm talking about and that journey can be, gosh, it's like, it's, it's hard. Like hunting, like hundred percent hunting is hard. And I got a slide up here that shows just how hard hunting is. But I think that you know, the reasons that we think hunting is hard are different than the actual reasons why it's hard. So I call, like I talk a lot about perceived barriers and, and what are those perceived barriers? And, and I'll walk you through a few of them and I, maybe these resonate with you. Um, well, probably the first thing is, is like, you know, I, I ask people this question, like what, what, you know, what are you, what are you most worried about as a new hunter? And they're like, well, the first thing is whether I could pull the trigger, whether I could be confronted by an animal, have this opportunity and pull the trigger. Now, I've, I've been present with lots of people on their first hunts and I've watched people go through this process. It's a tremendously emotional process that requires so much focus and ability to calm down, to be present in the moment, and then to have to make this very difficult decision as to whether or not you a, have the skill set, if it's an eth ethical shot to pull the trigger on, on this animal. And then once that process, you know, passes, there's, there's, you know, likely a dead animal involved and, uh, and then that emotional process of, of recognizing the, the magnitude of what has just happened, that you've taken the life of an animal. So, you know, this is one of the big ones. It's just whether you have the confidence um, that, that, that you have the skills as a marks person to shoot the animal, but also be able to make that decision to pull the trigger. The, the, the next one here is, and this is Mickey with her first buck, and I was so fortunate to be there with her when, when this happened. And, uh, and just that emotional connection to the animal and, and, to, and, and um, acknowledging this very profound human experience of taking something's life. And uh, this is Mickey taking some time to, to uh, reflect on that moment and, and um, be, you know, be present in, in, in the moment and, uh, and give thanks to the animal and, and, and the place. And I think that's something that's so important that uh, it, we, we should, shouldn't overlook in, in the process and be prepared for and think about a little bit before you kind of step into this world that, you know, having your own sort of ceremony or process for uh, giving thanks to the animal is something that that's super important because it is a, it is a hell of a whammy when you, you know, the emotional whammy of, of going through this with, with uh, I, you know, I'd like to say like your first time, but it, it's, you know, I've, I've been doing this a long time and harvested lots of animals and that emotional impact doesn't change, um, not a whole lot over time. So, that's definitely a barrier and it's a barrier for all of us and it should be because it's a, it's a profound experience. The other barrier that I hear about a lot, and this is a, this is a big pile of guts here and a big pile of your guts and is yeah, whether or not you would know what to do once the animals, you know, on the ground, dead in front of you, how to take care of the meat. Well, the first thing is get the guts out. And, and, and I think people feel like it could be quite a difficult process to remove the guts from an animal. And I, I have to say that it's, it's actually like, it's actually pretty easy. It, you know, after doing it a few times, it's like, it should take about five minutes to get the guts out. 
it's actually not that gross. I mean, it's a little little gross, but it's actually I find it more interesting because you get to see how you know bodies come together. How often do you get to see what intestines actually look like, or what a heart looks like, or lungs and all this stuff, and and liver, and and it's super interesting and fascinating. So I think if you're open to just get past the sort of the blood and guts of it, it's actually a very interesting process, and it's a relatively easy to coach you through it. And uh, there's lots of videos out there. We have a video on how to do it, and we also do workshops that we show people how to do it. So. And then the last one probably that people sort of in their head, and it's a genuinely reasonable barrier or perceived barriers, is that getting the animal out. And, uh, you know, getting the animal back to camp can be as simple as tying a rope to the antlers and dragging it down the hill back to the truck or road or, or boat or whatever. Um, you know, oftentimes we, we like earlier pictures, we, you know, we skin the animal out in the picture, out in the, in the field and uh, break it into manageable size pieces and backpack it out. Um, but, you know, if you have time and a bit of strength and a bit of will, Getting an animal out of the woods is, is not difficult. It's just a process, and, and it's one that anybody can do. And Probably another one that I, and I think this is probably, you know, there's perceived barriers and there's actual barriers. Now, now this is one I would say is kind of an actual barrier, which is like, you know, getting comfortable in the woods. Because I think for a lot of folks, uh, there's a lot of uh, preconceived concepts of what hazards may exist in the forest, like, you know, I get a lot of questions about bears, bear safety, wolf safety, cougar safety, you know, obviously getting lost and, and, and all these are very real concerns. And, and I, but I think they're also, um, uh, very, very low, low risk factors. I mean, the highest risk factor actually is just staying warm and dry and comfortable and not, uh, you know, getting, getting wet, cold and hypothermic, which is the number one concern that you should have for being out in the woods and most people think about bears and wolves and other things more much much more when the real thing is to develop the skills to be comfortable in the woods so that you can stay warm and dry have the right gear and, and I could and I could show you how to do all that stuff it's actually relatively manageable so you can manage a lot of the you know of the risk by being prepared and, and, and developing that comfort and uh, and then yeah so that, that's probably one real big one um, the other one is like just being able to wander around in the woods and not get lost. And that's another skill set that you can develop over time. And there's incredibly good resources now. I mean, iPhones can basically um, have the tools in terms of navigating software or navigating apps that, you know, with a pretty short lesson, you can be pretty reliably know where you are at all times and get back to the vehicle or the road or camp. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge step forward and, 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 you know, when I, when I grew up, you know, orienteering or nav wandering around the woods, I was, you know, map and compass and, you know, and very rud rudimentary basic GPS at one time. And now I just have a phone that just basically has an image and a, and basically points me in the right direction all the time, which is definitely cheating. And I would encourage you to build the foundational skills of orienteering with maps and compasses. But I think that developing these skills have never been more accessible to folks. Hunting skills. This is this is my dog Claire. If you haven't met her yet, she's uh, her, her she'll be sixteen at Christmas this year. She's uh, been a bit of been a trooper, um, but Claire <laughs> Claire and I have hunted tons together uh, over the years. This is uh, we're sort of on a mule deer spot and stock hunt. This is the kind of hunt where you spend a lot of a lot of time behind a spotting scope looking around at stuff, and then eventually, if you see an animal, you go climb up the mountain and try and get after it. Um, tons of fun. Um, but yeah, hunting is, there, there, there's lots of hunting skill to develop over time. Uh, and that can be a perceived barrier or an actual barrier for sure. But that's what's so fun about hunting. And I'll probably get into it a little bit later is that like, there's so many, so much, uh, it's fun to learn. And, and, and you're going to come up empty. You might come up empty for years as you get into this, but the whole time you're learning. And every time you learn a little bit more, it's rewarding. And uh, being on that learning curve of, of hunting is, is forever. Uh, the learning curve, and uh, you're always learning something, and eventually you'll have some success. So, whatever system of hunting you're you're applying, whether it's spot and stock or still hunting or hunting ducks or whatever, or driving around and looking for stuff on the road, all of it is you know requires some a skill set that you'll develop, but it's uh, tons of fun. So, one thing that's kind of cool is that like, well, there's a lot to learn about hunting, and as as you go on your journey you already have a lot of the skills to be a hunter. You might be really good in the woods already. You probably have an interest in backpacking and camping and it, those types of things. And if all of those skills are transferable to becoming 
uh, a hunter. And so this is uh, this is actually one of our backpack hunter workshops where we we take a group of people out into the woods and up into the mountains and show them you know all of the knowledge that we have about how to hunt up in the mountains and how to be safe and and uh, in that environment and, and and review a lot of different gear and stuff that you can use to make these trips safer, more fun, and uh, generally more comfortable. Um, but, you know, a lot of the folks that are part of this are, are people who have done a lot of backpacking and have a lot of the gear already, and they're just transitioning to this new concept of, of taking on hunting as a, as a new uh, application for their existing skill set. So I think it's important to remember that it's not, you know, that there's, there's, you're not necessarily starting from square one, right? Now, on this journey, and this is the coolest part about this journey of becoming a hunter is you just get so much opportunity to learn about food. And I encourage you as you're on this journey to, to, you know, volunteer for opportunities or like put up your hand when someone says, Hey, we're going to butcher a deer this weekend. Can you come over and give us a hand and put up your hand and come jump in and learn about it. This is, um, my good friend, Spencer. He's, uh, uh, he's a Shimshin, uh, uh, he's from Shimshin territory, which is up North in BC and, uh, uh, holds a lot of traditional knowledge. Um, from his elders and that uh, this was he was coaching us or showing us how to uh can meat and uh, it's a traditional activity from the from his his community where he's from and uh they 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 can meat as a means of preserving uh uh game meat to, 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 to last the the years and uh this was a lot of fun I, I never can meat before and it was just a recent example of that lifelong journey of learning and, and learning about food and, and geeking out about stuff so this is another fun one. This is our annual sausage making party. Again, if you have lots of meat in your life, and, and we actually have a lot of meat in our life, and one of the things that we, we do every year is make a bunch of sausages. And uh, it's a nice way of using up some ground meat, but it's, all, but it's more it's just fun to have a big sausage party with your friends. And uh, everybody goes home with a satchel of sausage. And uh, yeah, and uh, it's just a ton of fun. And the sausages are just a wonderful meal to have uh, year round. So yeah, fun parties. There's so much more to this way of life too. And I love this slide. This is a, this is my friend, Jody. We do lots of uh, Jody, Jody Peck. She does a lot of workshops with Eat Wild, focusing on the food and, and uh, wild foraging aspects of stuff. So like everybody that I know that hunts, it's also picks mushrooms and, you know, has an interest in, you know, looking for wild edibles like fiddleheads and other cool things like that. And so as a community, like we, we, we're always out there looking to, you know, always looking for food in the forest as an excuse to go out and wander around the woods to learn something else, to try the, to cook up something unique and cool. So this is uh, Jody teaching me a little bit about the spring um, oyster mushroom harvest. It was tons of fun. And probably the coolest thing that you're going to find on this journey is that you're going to be part of a bigger community of people who are also learning about this cool stuff. So I, I really invite you to join on this journey. And uh, I think it's it's been so wonderful to be in a place where I, you know, as a, I've been facilitating this journey for a lot of people. And it's really cool to see like what, how it's transformed people's lives and, and, and the community they've built around hunting and harvesting wild food and, and, and eating amazing food together. So it's great to be sort of being paralleling that for a lot of people. And uh, it's been cool. Anyways, um, this, I'll just, I'll break here and then we're going to jump into the next section on sort of what it would take for you to find your way to becoming a hunter. All right, so hopefully I got you excited and you're like, yeah, okay, what do I got to do? Where do I sign up? Like, what's the deal? Like, how do we get, how do I become a hunter? And, and uh, there's, it's a long journey and I've kind of mentioned that before and I'll, I'll kind of reinforce that probably as I get through these next few slides. But there's, of course, to be a hunter in BC, you have to have a license. So the, so one of the first steps is to knock off the licensing component. Um, that's easily done. I, I, we've recently launched our online core class, which is lots of me talking to you folks about, um, about, yeah, why I hunt and, 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 uh, the regulations and, and safety aspects of hunting as well as ethics and, uh, wildlife identification. And it's, it's a pretty fun course. It's a, it's about 16 hours of, of, of content and lecture, plus lots of supplemental stuff, lots of supplemental videos and access to podcasts and other cool things to help you guide you along the way. So that, that we, so you can sign up for that anytime and get started if that's, if it's interesting. If you're, uh, there's lots of in-person classes uh, throughout the British Columbia, which you can check those out as well. Um, but yeah, definitely the first step is to get that that licensing piece, and uh, and then you then you, you you're legally allowed to go hunting. 
So in addition to your hunting license, you also need to have a firearms license, which requires you to take a Canadian firearms safety course. Uh, that's also, we provide that all as well through the Eat Wild um, website. And uh, it's an in-person class. Um, it's definitely a hands-on class. So it's, it's in person. And, uh, and that class will support you to be able to um, uh, be able to qualify for your uh, possession and acquisition license. And you need that to basically to purchase, to carry and own a firearm as well as purchase ammunition. So it's a comprehensive course. It's a day long, a uh, long day and, uh, and we'll get you sorted out there as well. Now that's kind of the easy stuff to kind of knock off cause it's, there's courses it's there, but there's, there's kind of a lot more to think about to becoming a hunter. And I think that this slide, it's a, it's a bit of a busy slide and I probably have overcomplicated it a little bit, but I think it's important to have a look at this and just, just so you know kind of the reality of what we're talking about when it comes to hunter success. And I, if you, if you look here and, um, uh, th this sort of shows, uh, the number of hunters that are out there, the amount of days that hunters commit and the number of animals killed for that effort. Now, the important column here is the success rate of the, on the, on the far end here. And you can see that this is, this describes the number of days that it takes for the average hunter to harvest an animal in a season. So there's some pretty high numbers here. And if you look down a little bit here, we'll go to say mule deer, 30 to one. So on average, the average hunter, it takes them 30 days of hunting effort to harvest uh, a, a mule deer in BC. Now, um, 41 for a white tail days. And, th and those are probably the two areas, most two, two most like um, commonly uh, harvested animals, 33 days uh, for a black bear that the, that top line. So those are probably the most accessible, accessible hunts and accessible meat hunts, whether it's bear, mule deer, or white tailed deer. Now that number seems pretty high to me, but I think it's reflective of just, you know, how people count their days as well. Like when I, you know, in my mind, if I'm going hunting, you know, I hunt from dawn till dusk and uh, we're hunting pretty darn hard. And my average is a lot better than this. I think that for some people, they, they approach hunting differently. Um, they might be more selective when they hunt, or they might be, be just hunt the mornings and take the rest of the day off. Um, or maybe their effort is maybe limited to just driving around the vehicle and, and kind of passively hunting, which, you know, while you're hunting, you're maybe not hunting, creating the best op opportunity for success for yourself. Um, having said all that, like, I think that it's fairly, it's somewhat reflective of, of it being very difficult to hunt. Um, so this is why it's really important to say, build relationships with, and build hunting relationships, build, build a team of hunters to go hunting. So if there's say four of you going on a mule deer hunt together for a week, that's, you know, four times seven, that's 28. Now, if all four of you put in a real solid effort, you'll probably meet the average hunting effort, which means that for, you'll be putting in about 28 days, pretty darn close to that 30. So if four of you go and put an effort in, you come back with one deer, that's success. And the best part is you learn a bunch. You, if you have that one harvest that you all get to participate in, in, uh, working on that animal as well as, you know, sharing knowledge about you, if you're all off, off hunting differently and trying different things out at the end of every day, you can share your knowledge within your group and gosh, if you come home with one deer, great, that sounds great. And then, you know, as you improve and then, and, and beat the average over the years, maybe it's two deer the next year. And maybe eventually you get to a place where, you know, you, you, you get three or four deer, and that's starting to look pretty, pretty darn good. And uh, that's, that starts filling the freezer. So I think it's important to maintain reasonable expectations if you do jump into this world. It's not really, it takes years and years of commitment to where you can, you know, fill your freezer year over year successfully. And I, you know, I certainly have some friends who have started late in life as hunters and they've been able to successfully fill their freezers. I, I But I know many, many more people that struggle to fill their freezer every year because of, um, just lack of available time and other, and other factors. So this journey that you, that you need to take on is there's the licensing part and probably the other must do, and it's a, definitely hard to do and is to learn to shoot and, and finding a way to, um, practice shooting so that you, when given the chance, you can have an ethical shot of an animal. And I, I probably the easiest route to do this is to join a, uh, 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 join a range in your community. Most, most communities have a rifle range that you can, uh, go and shoot on a regular basis. And there's lots of other people there and you can often reach out and build relationships with more experienced shooters who might spend some time teaching you. Um, we do a, sh a shooting skills workshop, which is a hands-on workshop 
where we take a group of people and we, we, we have shooting mentors that teach the foundational pieces for, for safe shooting. And, uh, and that's a great, it's a great workshop. We, we try to offer it a couple times a year. It's a little bit difficult to offer because it requires us to rent the range space and such, but keep an eye out for that one if you want to learn, but I encourage you to go ahead and, and, uh, just join a range and, uh, and, and get out shooting. There, there are some opportunities to shoot on crown land. If you're far enough away from the lower mainland and any no shooting areas where you can set up with a safe backdrop and, and shoot in the, in, in, on crown land. Um, but you know, it's often much simpler just to use the facility of a range. Another good tip for starting out. And I love this one. This is a great shot of uh, some good friends of mine on a, on a deer hunt. Now the, there's uh, a number of people volunteered to come on this hunt just cause they wanted to hang out. And, uh, and they want, it was, we ended up having, uh, uh, the, um, the whole group of us, there's probably three hunters and three folks that just wanted to come and hang out. And it's always a great opportunity to come and be a packer on a hunt. Cause you, you get to participate. There's lots of work to do. You might, in this case, Jana got a buck. So everybody jumped in and helped her pack out her buck. Um, but you get to be part of that experience. And like, this is a great way to learn about hunting and, and, uh, and it's a great first step. So, you know, if you're thinking about becoming a hunter and, and, and wondering if this could be for you, like, you know, put your hand up if someone, you know, says, Hey, like I'll, I'll come and help out at camp and pack an animal out of required. And then it's just a camping trip for you. And it's tons of fun too. The other one I like is start small. This is one of my friends. This is just a great shot. I was looking for the perfect shot of somebody, you know, har harvesting, uh, their, their, their first grouse. And this one really captures the how incredible like this journey is for hunting. And this is, uh, he was my friend and she had, you know, she's been, she put in quite a bit of time before she got to this stage where she shot her first grouse and man, was it ever fun to be part of this when she successfully, you know, shot her first grouse and recovered it. And, uh, what a smile to, to share. But I think it's important to remember, like, I think a lot of people sort of jump ahead in their process of, of like, Oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to go get a six point bull elk. Well, you know, I, I hunted for 20 years before I shot a six point bull elk or something like that, maybe, you know? So I think that it's, uh, important to remember that, um, that, uh, you, you know, I, you know, the first few years of hunting with my dad, I just shot quails and grouse and then, you know, and then I just shot white tailed deer and it wasn't until I was, you know, and then eventually graduated to, to moose and, and, you know, and then in my, early twenties, I started elk hunting and then, you know, that was a difference for sure. You know, like, and it wasn't until I was 45 that I shot, shot a sheep, a, a mountain sheep. And like, it, it's a graduated process. It takes some time to like build the skill set to do these hunts. So there's no need to expect that you're going to get there, you know, right away. And, uh, and, uh, so starting small, it's a great place to start. Now there's endless gear that's needed and, and, and there's no shortage of people who will sort of talk about, uh, you know, what type of gear you might need for, for a trip. And, uh, and I think that, you know, there's podcasts and videos and stuff, but probably the thing to remember is that you don't have to get all this stuff right away. This is stuff that over time you can accumulate. A lot of this gear you probably already have, whether it's like warm clothes or a Gore-Tex jacket. Um, and then, and then kind of have a, I would encourage you to have a gear plan. So you start by like thinking about a budget that, that works for you, whether it's $500 a year or, or, um, or, and, and then, and work to your budget and just develop a plan as to what you can afford. And, uh, and then have a mentor or a friend who's an experienced hunter kind of look at your plan and, and provide some guidance. I've got a few videos on, you know, where to invest, you know, whether it's in a firearm or optics or, um, the type of gear that you should have in a day pack, uh, for, for your day hunts, all that stuff is, um, and there's also, like I said, podcasts and other things that can provide some guidance on how to prioritize and, uh, definitely a longer, uh, conversation. But I think the important part is just have a plan. It doesn't have to happen today. You, you can start out with the bare minimum. Uh, one rule of thumb I would say is like, if, you know, you can probably buy a rifle and binoculars and a scope for, a thousand dollars. And that's kind of the entry point. So you have a rifle, good pair of binoculars and a scope on the rifle that gets you out the door. Now it's not the best rifle, not the best optics, but it's a good place to start. Um, and then you can fill up the rest of the gear around it over time. Probably the coolest thing that's happened in the last sort of five years for, for hunters here in British Columbia is, uh, like the growth in 
the backcountry hunters and anglers, uh, which is a which is a conservation group. What I really like about it is it really attracts a young and diverse group of people to their events and uh, and their community. And that what's great about it is that the, it, it's it's what's more welcoming than say I, there are other conservation organizations in in British Columbia and they're very effective at what they do. And there also would be a great place to invest your time and effort to build community and relationships. Um, but, you know, if I'm talking to the community who I think I'm talking to, which is a relatively young group of folks thinking of, thinking about if this is right for them, this might be a good place to, to check out. There's sort of monthly meetings. They look a lot like this one slide in the middle where the people are having a beer, checking out our presentation. Um, we will, we'll get together as a, as a group and, and usually have a speaker come in and, uh, have a couple beers and then we just network and hang out. And then we organize sort of conservation related events. There's recently, there's been a couple of cleanups. Uh, we do some camera trap monitoring projects. It's a, probably a longer, we do, uh, trail cam monitoring of wildlife populations, which is a cool project we're involved in here in region two. Um, so just lots of cool stuff. Um, we put on wild game dinner parties occasionally. It's been on hold for obvious reasons. But lots of cool stuff we can do, and but the most important thing is it, it brings you into a community of new hunters that are ha, have common interest in hunting and conservation, and uh, it's a great place to build community and, and hopefully find you know hunting partners and others. Some other things that can help steer you in the right direction. We, this is you know this is we do um, a series of webinars on you know how to hunt webinars, sort of doing a deep dive into topics that I think are important to becoming a successful hunter. And uh, I, I got videos and lecture and often bring in other people to help me do these and they're tons of fun. So you can keep an eye out for those. We also do like field courses. And then, so this is our hunter field skills workshop where we bring together a bunch of people and we teach them fundamentals of how to hunt in the woods and, uh, and do everything from like uh, how to, how to sneak around and find deer, how to orienteer, how to shoot. Um, and then we feed you amazing food. So that's a, that's a real hit. We do those twice a year. They're, they often sell out. So if you're interested in that full spectrum experience, then that's, that's the one you want to look for. That's the Hunter Field Skills Workshop. Um, another thing you can kind of get into if you just want to do a soft entry into the hunting world is check out some of our podcasts because we do um, about a, every month or so, I get a podcast out and with a focus on, you know, making sure that hunting is... Uh, an inclusive and welcoming environment for new hunters. And so lots of educational stuff, uh, lots of foundational stuff on how wildlife management works. And this a great one here with uh, talking about smartphone navigation. And uh, these are great, great resources for, for a new hunter to find their way in this community. Um, there's also YouTube mining. There's so much information on YouTube, good, bad, indifferent. I don't know. <laughs> but uh our our channel is kind of dedicated to you know those foundational pieces. Anytime I can think of a of something that I could somehow illustrate through a video, I usually get a camera and a mic and try to make something that is uh, tells a port, an important story for a new hunter who's trying to find their way. So you can check that out. I think above all though, and this is you know something I you know I can't really help you with. I can try to give you lots of information, but really at the core of this is trying to find a mentor. Like I'm so lucky that I have great mentors in my hunting life. And, uh, they're, that is just, that's why I'm a good hunter is I had good manners and they sent me on the right way to learn how to hunt. And, uh, that's something that's really challenging. I know. And, you know, being part of those conservation communities, whether it's the BC Wildlife Federation and the BC, um, backcountry hunters and anglers, um, that really helps build those relationships. But any chance you get when you meet a hunter, you know, take that extra few minutes, have a conversation, see if there's a connection there, a spark there, because that might be the mentor that's going to help you along their way. The, like a, the reality is a lot of, a lot of the old, well, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of hunters are aging out, myself included. I'm 45 years old. I can't hunt the way I used to hunt when I was 20. So like, I'm willing to share a lot of information around how I, you know, areas that I, I no longer hunt because I physically maybe can't hunt there the same way I used to, or, or maybe I'm just not interested in going back there. I've got lots of information to share. And as I get older, I, I'm going to need more young hunters to support me as I, as I, as I, as I get older to, to pack more gear, more gear and more animals, uh, uh, along with me. So I'm always looking to build my, my community of mentors. And I've been really investing that in those relationships with, with younger hunters. Um, and that's actually Jeff here on the left-hand side of this image here. He kind of identified, you know, he kind of grabbed me as a kid and said, "Hey, I'll I'll take you under my wing as a as an adventure hunter and, and take you along." And really, it was just a, just a strategic approach for him to have someone young to to you know help him you know 
pack animals off the mountain and, and, and keep up with them because a lot of his buddies were aging out and weren't all that interested in, in pursuing hunting the same way he pursued it. Um, but I suspect there's a lot of that. So as you meet these elderly hunters, uh, you'll see if there's an opportunity to, to deepen that relationship and uh, maybe they'll share knowledge or take you out. And I would encourage you to invest any time you can into finding a mentor because it is, it is definitely the hardest thing to do, but also the most rewarding. So I, I'm kind of coming to my end here of this of this sort of conversation with you. And I I think a, one of the things I want to just leave with you is like, you know, this is all of, I, I really tried to paint a full picture of why hunting is so important to me in my way of life and, and all the goodness it brings to me and the community it brings. And, and even without hunting success, like, you know, killing something, I get so many of those wonderful things come into my life. And, uh, and I think it's important to say to you, like, hey, like, like hunting is a lifelong journey. So, like, there's no hurry. And, uh, you know, there, it took me, like I said, I think it took me 15 years of hunt planning to find myself in the situation where I'd successfully harvested a, a sheep on a trip like this. And, and uh, it took a long time. And, you know, I've been hunting, dedicated hunting for 35 years of my life. And uh, it's taken a long time to build up my, my skill set and my confidence and, to be a successful hunter year over year. Um, but that takes time and, but it's been an awesome journey. So I like, so like, don't be in a hurry. Like you, 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 they just enjoy the ride, enjoy the journey they say. Right. So anyway, I, I encourage you to, to, to come along for that journey and, and don't be in a hurry, just enjoy it along the way. Right. So, um, yeah, you know, the message for me to you is like, Hey, like c- come join us, find your way. And like, we'd be happy to support you through eat wild. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, if you have any, questions about you know you know what's next for you i mean obviously you can find us at eatwild.ca that's our website and a lot of these courses and workshops are all listed there if you want to reach out to me directly i'm pretty active on instagram so you can message me directly there at at, at eatwild and of course you can just email me directly dylan at eatwild.ca and uh, hopefully i can help you find your way so I i hope this was fun i hope it was informative and uh just been yeah, I've been meaning to try, to try and share something like, like this for a while and uh, finally got around to putting it together. So hopefully you've enjoyed it. And um, yeah, and uh, until next time, eat well, eat wild. Talk to you later.